This is the last panel of the conference. Tanya, come on stage. Are you going to sit with them? Yeah, I think so. I'll just sit on the edge. Yeah, okay. I'm going to sit on the edge. It's fine. Oh, oh. There's, no, there's no chair. Oh. Oh, <laughs> sit down. I'll That's stand. okay. I'll stand. I can stand. No, no, it's fine. Uh, cool. Okay, so I think uh, we've got a pretty interesting way to close off the day and we promise we won't keep you along. We'll, we've all agreed to call it, keep it short and snappy and punchy. Uh, so we're talking about uh, how everyone in the room can pr prepare for uh, an addressable TV stampede uh, in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, so before I guess we open today, I really wanted to take a little bit of a look back um, to where we've come from and where we are today. I think it's really interesting, the three key things, and I'd be interested to see if you guys picked up on this as well. Um, TV has changed, um, definitely throughout the theme of today. Uh, TV itself has got categorically changed. Um, and I think as a consumer, I love it. Uh, but I think as, as a brand and a marketer, it's, it's getting a little bit more tricky to kind of do the things that you used to do really well on television. Uh, so, Nev, I, I guess I wanted to put the first question to you. Obviously, um, we've seen a lot of change over TV, um, from colour TV launching in the 50s uh, to second channel TVs, uh, second channels on TV launching, SVODs coming into the market, and then dynamic trading, automated trading, um, addressable TV. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what the learnings are during this journey and kind of potentially from a Foxtel Media perspective, how you adapted to this change? So, um, from a Foxtel Media uh, perspective, um, I think the change is good. Yeah. Um, I think it keeps you on your toes. Um, I think one of the key learnings is um, you may never get it right first time, but that doesn't mean you should stop. Um, I just think you need to evolve and adapt quickly. Um, I think consumers nowadays have less patience. <laughs> when things don't work, they're very vocal to tell you. I think KO as a product, and we'll talk about that from a change perspective, changed um, our business greatly. Um, it was a streaming service purely built for sport, had a new way to consume sport, created content which were minis, which haven't really been seen, but there were short 30 minute clips of AFL, NRL games, and consumers just wanted to engage them straight away. Um, but when we started to do dynamic ad insertion, we started to realize that we were slowing down that user journey a little bit. And when I mean a little bit, I'm talking three seconds. And from an advertising head, we were like, no, that's fine. From the producers and content side, they were like, that's not fine. Paid for customers that are um, engaging on your platforms can't tolerate that. So we actually started to dial back the number of customers that we were dynamically adding third in until the technology caught up until we could get a product that was sustainable and then we set it live again. So I think for us it's more about create platforms, create it on areas that they want to engage on, um, but don't force it on them. Let them naturally move to, the, to, to where they want to go. But from an advertising standpoint, we do it correctly. Um, because if you start launching things and the ad experience isn't right, you know what, you will lose those customers, and especially when you're paid for, um, and they may never come back. Um, or if they do, they will have a really sour view to that ad experience, and we don't want brands to have that experience. Yeah, I agree. Um, Jody, I think because um, you're from T TVNZ and you've got a unique perspective on the, I guess, the New Zealand market, did you see the same sort of trajectory of change as what we experienced in the Australian market? Uh, thanks, New Tanya. Zealand. <laughs> I think just to start with some context as well, um, there's a couple of things I'll just talk about from a New Zealand perspective. So firstly, we're a country with five million people. So when you're thinking about scale, think of it in terms of the size of Sydney. Uh, secondly, within our market as well, television is very cheap uh, or cost efficient. You know, if you're thinking, <laughs> that's probably the more appropriate Fair word. word. <laughs> um, but in fairness it is, you know, you're paying $11 a CPM and you're probably paying four or five times that when you're talking about a BVOD platform. So it's actually quite different from a price perspective uh, in the New Zealand market. And the third thing is that, you know, our BVOD product, TVNZ On Demand, it's 13 years old. 
you know, so we actually launched the service 13 years ago. We're a teenager this year. Um, and from our perspective, we really saw a massive change about three or four years ago. And we started with the data. So you think about the segmentation and we did a lot of work around our audiences and what they wanted to watch and where they wanted to watch it, which we've continued to invest in. Uh, but equally, we spent a lot of time um, investing in all of our content rights to make sure we could obviously go across all platforms. We obviously needed to acquire new content. So over 60% of our content on OD is also exclusive to only OD. Um, we've been a, spent a truckload of money in marketing. So if you talk about branding, yep, we invested in it and we're there for the long haul. Um, and then the third piece was also around user experience. So we very quickly learned what users wanted and what they didn't want. And we're constantly having conversations with them, whether it's through focus groups or whether it's online discussions. So it's been a longer journey, but actually the last couple of years has been significantly uh, changed and the opportunity is really bright in, this, in that space. Yeah, and I think given that you guys have quite a deep understanding and learnings of the journey that probably Australia market is on, it'd be really <coughs> interesting to see cross-market collaboration mm. with things like measurement mm. as well as like user experiences. I know that there's some consistencies that got caught out today about um, ad pods and ad loads. It's very inconsistent and not standardised across our market. And I think what I'd like to see is us move forward and kind of start standardising that to make it much more easier for brands and marketers um, when we're kind of buying across. So I wanted to talk, touch on a little bit about BVOD and have a little bit of, um, I guess, a sky, um, a blue sky, like, um, look at BVOD. So I found a stat that PwC Entertainment said by 2023, a BVOD market will represent $441 million in Australia. Now, I'm open to, for interpretation on this one. And Jono, I'm going to, I'm going to reach out to you on this because is that realistic given this kind of feedback? You know, we had the, our Uber client get up and talk about like it kind of broadcasters need to kind of fix the tech a bit in the BVOD market. Um, do you think it's a realistic, what could be holding us back from hitting that? Um, and also what percentage of that is gonna, going to be actual addressable? So first and foremost on um, is the PWC number realistic? My answer is we, 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 and again, we. <laughs> about this. If you actually attended this conference and think otherwise, uh, you're probably deaf, so uh, go get it, get checked. Uh, no, definitely, I think, you know, there's a very positive story around this. Um, if you look at the revenue from um, last year, it actually grew by 40% with actually an acceleration in the second half. Yeah. To actually achieve that number that PWC put out, we simply need to maintain a 30% growth year on year. So it's not only achievable, I actually think we're gonna smash this. We've done that growth without the ability to, um, to look at uh, measurements thanks to VOZ, to have enhanced you know, measurement and targeting on, on platforms like CTV. So there is absolutely no doubt from my point of view that, uh, that this is going to happen. Yeah, and do you, do you have a kind of an estimate of how, what percentage of that would be represented by addressable TV campaigns? Or? Well, we, we go back to um, what is addressable yeah. TV, right? So um, you probably heard Nat Harvey taking you through um, Seven Gap, uh, you know, um, uh, contextual placement on TV built with um, AWS. This to me is also addressable TV. It's on a linear stream, but it is addressable. Um, and the second thing I would say is that we need to be a bit careful about, uh, and a couple of people mentioned that, our obsession about data, you know, targeting and all of that. Because ultimately, there is also on the margin of the people that you consider being in your prospect demographic, people who will buy the product. And if you don't reach out to them, your competitor may and win market share out of you. So data, yes, to inform decisions, to inform planning, but not necessarily um, micro-targeting. So we need to make sure that uh, video drives scale and drives ROI so that we have more investment coming into marketing and growth. Cool. So I think I also wanted to reach out to our tech representatives on the panel today, so <laughs> Juliet from Teleria and also Vince, who's visiting from the UK, from Xander. Um, I also wanted to gauge an understanding of how much do you think programmatic will play a role in driving those, how will it accelerate those BVOD numbers? And um, I guess from a programmatic perspective, um, what, what are some key learnings you've learned over the last couple of years seeing it go from quite a small type buy to quite a large kind of buy? Juliet? Okay, cool. <laughs> um, so just for a bit of context, um, I'm the Senior Vice President for Telaria across the Asia-Pacific business. 
Um, in Australia and New Zealand, we work very closely with Channel 7, Channel 9, Channel 10, Foxtel Media, um, SBS. Um, and in New Zealand, we work with TVNZ and MediaWorks. So we've got really great exposure to what's happening across all of those broadcasters in Australia and New Zealand from a BVOD perspective. And when it comes to BVOD, we work with all of that supply, whether it's you know, the catch-up side, catalog and um, ca catch up and catalog content. That's hard to say. <laughs> catch up and catalog. Or whether it's the live linear, whether it's the live sport content. So there's real complexities and differences between each of those different types of supply. And we work, acro work across all of the BVOD. So whether it's desktop, mobile, web, mobile app, connected TV. So there are, th there are huge challenges across all of that supply, but we've been working with all of these broadcasters for so long that we've really got it down to a pretty fine art now. I think when it comes to programmatic, it's really important to bear in mind the fact that programmatic with, with BVOD, with long-form video, is very different to programmatic with something like display. So when it comes to display, I think a lot of us would have experienced this or seen this at least in the market. You know, huge volumes, very low CPMs, generally open auction based buys. Whereas when it comes to BVOD, as all of us know, you know, you generally see private marketplace driven buying of, of BVOD supply. And in fact, across Australia and New Zealand, we'd say that about 95, 96% of everything that we see um, is actually private marketplace driven um, trading. And in most cases, it's actually fixed price as well. So when it comes to programmatic and the role of programmatic, from a buyer's perspective, it's generally there within this BVOD environment in order to control frequency, reach and frequency. You know, this is TV. TV is really good at making brands famous. To make a brand famous, you've got to achieve reach. One of the things that's difficult with linear broadcast when it comes to reach is how do you achieve reach without oversaturating the audience? When it comes to BVOD, you can actually implement frequency caps so that you can control reach. And so it's a way of saying, OK, this, this is TV, which is awesome. And we can, we can actually challenge some of the problems that have previously existed in TV. So programmatic, I think it's really important to recognize programmatic is not a dirty word when it comes to BVOD. As long as you actually handle this supply with respect and you treat it differently and recognize that it deserves higher CPMs than we have seen driven down in that display environment, then it's a really positive asset and positive part to, to the experience. Um, when it comes to what we do, so we're the platform that allows all of this stuff to happen, to run the auctions, to handle the deals, operational efficiencies, all the really exciting stuff. But the other thing to bear in mind is, um, so we spend a lot of time and energy building out the product so that we can enhance the brand experience and so that we can protect the user. So we prevent back-to-backs from appearing, which in a programmatic environment, and especially against really complex supply, somebody earlier, Tim from, um, from Yospace, was talking about server-side ad insertion supply, which you know, it's very complex, but essentially it means you prefetch all of the ads up front, and then you stitch them into the content so that you've got a seamless transition between ad and content. In that scenario, it can be really, really difficult to, um, to actually achieve a strong programmatic result. Um, but you do create a really great user experience, really great brand experience, so it's worth the hassle. And so we build out a lot of functionality so that we can prevent back-to-backs, create competitor exclusions and so on, even in a pre-fetched, stitched environment. <laughs> So I think <laughs> that's great. Uh, God, okay, yeah. just one last thing. <laughs> Prefetch and stitch. God, it's some ridiculous words that you end up coming out with. From a person who hates jargon, it's quite a lot of jargon. Okay. Um, so brand experience, user experience, really important. The other thing, though, that I just want to mention when it comes to programmatic, because we've talked about this a lot all through the day, and we're going to be talking a lot about it now, data. Data is hugely important. It's really important that publishers invest to collect data, good, strong, rich data, to house it correctly, to use a great DMP, and to then surface it so that it can be leveraged and actioned. And those, you know, the Uber Eats um, case study was awesome. But it's really important as well that a publisher recognizes the value of that data so that they can protect that data so that it can be used by that publisher who has earned the right to access that data without just handing it over to the buy side in perpetuity based on one, one campaign. So in my mind, you know, programmatic can absolutely help achieve revenue, yield, all the great money stuff, but it should also be there to create a good brand experience, good user experience, and to protect the publisher's second best asset, which is data after content. Nice. <laughs> That's very good. That's a long answer, sorry. <laughs> Programmatic is one of those things that you can 
talk a lot about and bore everybody in the room with. <laughs> <laughs> well, Vince, I think what would be interesting, obviously you see global markets, um, and what could be interesting for the um, people in the room is actually to get an understanding way of what, um, I guess, evolution you've seen in a more mature addressable um, TV markets such as the US and also EU? Sure, sure. So um, it's very hard to kind of put out a trend of uh, Euro the European market. So many countries so very fragmented, yeah, very different true. from a country to another. But if we look at the UK, for example, um, four in five people are actually watching Bivot content. So it's very attractive for, uh, for marketers. And, and obviously, most of the consumption of that content is on CTV. Mm -hmm. So we get a lot of, of marketers who actually want to be part of that. Um, and I don't really agree with that, with, with the point that um, the technology that Tim was referencing with your space. Like it's actually a, a head of bidding has evolved so much. And I, was, I used to work a lot with broadcasters that I'd never believed in head of bidding before. Uh, but it turns out head of bidding now has evolved so much that there, it's, uh, you, it's kind of a compliant technology. You can be sure there will be no back-to-back -back because everything is done server side. And because it's done server side, you can be sure that the user experience is not impacted. So it has evolved a lot, and we see a lot of appetite for that in, in the US especially, but also in Europe. So um, we have clients who have implemented that in, in those markets, and we see some appetite as well in, in Australia. Now, when we talk about addressable TV in, um, in Europe and the US, we tend to talk about linear addressable TV. So in, in Europe, it's like the, the big talk at the moment. Uh, a country like France, they're changing the law to be able to do that, kind of a version of addressable TV, more segmented TV. Um, in the US, it's kind of more mature. Um, the setup is very different as well there, because we have uh, the distributors who are given two minutes of ads uh, per, per hour, uh, which is a very unique setup. We don't see that anywhere else. Um, so when you look at the trends in terms of investment in TV, which is pretty much the same everywhere, uh, it's kind of going down or it's flat year on year, depending on where, where you are. In the US, it's kind of flat, probably going to go down after the elections. Mm -hmm. um, but then w when you look at the investment that are made in addressable TV, they are going up by 5% year on year. When, and when you know how much money they put into that, it's a, it's a lot of money. 5% is giant. Mm -hmm. So uh, addressable TV is really what is driving the, the business in the US. And we are well positioned to, to, to say it because we represent 40% of the addressable TV impressions in the US. Mm -hmm. So when we look at that, um, addressable TV as it's done today is not very efficient. It's very manual. You still have to bring your own data if you're a buyer in, in the US. Um, there's a lot of excitement in Europe. So we kind of decided to build a, a platform that is simplifying all that. So simplifying and automating, automating the, the, the buying and, and the setting process of, of linear addressable TV. Um, with the goal to kind of combine and unify those two worlds. So that there's, there's a real, we're investing a lot. We, we saw that we, we, uh, we acquired Clip last year. Uh, we are creating new for ad formats as well. Uh, we are working very closely with our company we're very close to, which is NVIDI, uh, very uh, closely related to. Um, so we are investing a lot in, in that space, and we strongly believe in the talk discussions that we had today that um, the market is going to evolve towards a more unified way. So we want to build that tool for that. Yeah, that's cool, because I think anything that can make it easier for buyers and also for marketers is a good representation of collaboration. Mm -hmm. Actually, I wanted to talk a little bit about putting ourselves in the client seat, um, because obviously there are some things that we have to have a think about, like obviously TV in the past has been used as a mass medium. It's really great at doing branding. Um, we know it works. How do, I guess, how do we manage and make sure we don't get too targeted? Like, we don't, how do we manage to still use B-Board in a really branding type way, um, but with the addressable TV element, like how does data impact that? Maybe Nev, if you want to have a... So I think there's, I think there's two, two answers to this. From the, the addressable TV, if you look at it in terms of buying IP-driven dynamic ad insertion into live TV, there's, you've got to be comfortable in changing the way you currently buy video. <laughs> so, you know, currently we're driven predominantly by sport, so we see huge spikes of inventory <coughs> Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Um, so what happens is you've got buyers that set up campaigns Monday to Friday, even amount of budget every single day. You get to the day where they scale and they've captured budget off. So there's a, there's a way you've got to actually change the way you buy true addressable TV if you're, if you're going to do it. So the first thing is look at the way and buy where the audience is, not 
budget-wise. Data-wise, you've got to be careful because all you can start to do is when you do get an opportunity to get a scalable audience, um, and luckily enough with KO, we see huge audiences come on the weekend. If you start to overlay multiple data sets, you're going to constrain it. Um, look, Foxtel has the ability, and I was talking to the, the data team, there's 10,000 attributes on a customer. I was like, that's scary. To take that to an advertiser and micro-target, there's concerns. One, you'll never deliver a campaign. Yeah. Um, two, if someone does want to pay $4,000 CPM, I'll gladly take it. I don't think anyone Christian, in the room wants to pay um, $4,000 CPM. Christian's looking at me, but um, <laughs> I'll, I'll gladly take that. But <laughs> if you only deliver a small volume of customers to that, I, does it drive brand impact? No. Are there clients out there that do find value in targeting? Yes, because they don't have mass budgets. They don't have huge deep pockets. I'm not saying clients do nowadays, but they've got a... So they do want a level of targeting, but not to the point where you can't actually deliver any impression, stroke, any outcome. Yeah. So I think you've got to be really delicate on that. And you've got to be open. Yeah. And you've got to tell the client the seven different attributes they want, you only need three of them. You don't actually need the other four and actually dial back and be brave enough to say that, not think they might walk away from the buy if we can't do it. And I think that's the scary thing is actually saying no because um, you might lose the money and salespeople don't like losing money. So generally, <laughs> we'll throw everything at it. Yeah. Um, I mean, Judy, do you agree in your supply constrained market just by the general population in New Zealand? This must be come up a lot when, they, when you start looking at targeting across across your B-Vod yeah. ecosystem. Yeah, look, and the way that we talk to, um, to marketers and to agencies is actually around, you know, it shouldn't be one or the other, but it's how you use both. And you actually think about um, the B-Vod opportunities about incremental reach. So it's not actually about a targeted approach. It's about how do you actually talk to a, a portion of the audience that you might not capture in the mass um, linear channels or how do you have a different conversation them, with them around context or around relevance? You know, I think about using different creative executions in that BVOD space than what you might in the linear mass reach space. Um, and the third piece is also around the innovation. So the ability for Addressable to actually add a layer of innovation, whether it's a personalised ad or whether it's actually um, contextually relevant in terms of location or whether it's weather-based, you know, having those types of conversations with, with marketers and agencies allows them to understand the way that you use both mass and then the targeted but actually from an incremental reach perspective. Yeah that's yeah. cool and um, Jono like just in terms of the data being used in the BVOD ecosystem which can sometimes be, be prohibitive in delivering scale as well how I guess how are you guys managing it um, at Seven how are you building out a data asset that can help us scale campaigns as opposed to limit campaigns? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I guess for us, the, uh, we really look that with the lens of what's happening in the future. So uh, we look, if you look at you know, 2019, um, you know, the, and you look at the IAB report, BVOD has been you know, fueling the growth of digital advertising in market. And within that, within BVOD, CTV, connected TV is very much where the growth is. Mm -hmm. Connected TV is the future of TV to some extent. That linear is not going to be completely disappearing, <laughs> but it is a, a key uh, focus. You take um, aside with that, um, alongside with that, um, the disappearance of, um, of cookies mm -hmm. in the next couple of years, you have a situation where the focus for us is a people-based advertising solution, which means that we need to invest in solutions that are solely relying on logged in, registered users and, uh, users and verified to be able to actually empower clients to have significant impact on their business. It's not about having vanity metrics for the sake of saying two, three, four, ten, eleven 10, 11 millions. It's about actually driving um, an output. So to give you an example, like recently, we have the Olympics coming. Yes, it's coming. Uh, it's <laughs> happening in July Definitely and it happening. will be on 7 and 7 Plus will be the home of the Olympics. In that context, the way we crafted the games, we crafted the experience, we created a free experience which you won't have to log in, and a huge amount of services, features that will be sitting behind a login wall. And that is one of the ways where we leverage value exchange with the customer to create very strong data assets uh, to really future-proof um, the business. How do you, just out of, do you have a strategy to make sure that following the Olympics, those, uh, I guess, users are still yes. engaged? Um, and can talk a bit about that? 
I probably can't share much about this, <laughs> as you can imagine, but yeah. yes, of course. That's, yeah. you know, you can expect, uh, we expect 5 million individuals coming to 7 Plus to consume the games. 1.7 um, out of those will be exclusively consuming the games digitally. So obviously they're coming for the games. We need a strategy. We have a strategy to actually provide them with an experience after the games. Uh, to keep that loyalty that we build during the games. Yeah, cool. I think from a tech perspective, uh, it's really important that we use tech in a meaningful way, as you alluded to before, <laughs> Juliet. Like, it's not just necessarily about being super targeted yeah. or driving, like, super, I guess, um, tactical type responses from your campaigns. What are some considerations, I guess, buyers in the room should have a think about when they're thinking about how tech plays a role in this world? Um, well, I think from, from our perspective, we work very closely with the publishers to make sure that they're building out for multiple scenarios that a buyer might need them to respond to. So whether that's you know just passing through the right ID, which sounds really straightforward, but you know the IFA in a CTV scenario, you've got to be able to pass that through because there isn't a cookie. So just having the strong infrastructure in place that allows programmatic to do its thing when it comes to putting an ad in front of a person. Um, so making sure the infrastructure is there at a very basic level, as well as you know we've integrated with all the DMPs so that we can then target specific audience segments and so on. And beyond that, obviously, being able to surface content information, so content metadata in order to target specific shows or categories of shows. And I think essentially the, way, the approach that we take is let's look at all of the different things that we need to be able to respond to with a publisher to create a really great solution for the buy side, and then there's a toolkit that's available. And I think in terms of not then leveraging every single tool in the toolkit and ending up with two people, mm -hmm. you know, that's just an education process really and reminding everybody in the ecosystem that this is TV. Mm -hmm. You know, this is a really great way of getting an ad storytelling, you know, to, to a big strong audience. Um, so it's the toolkit approach in my mind. And I think also reminding everybody that just because you can doesn't mean you always yeah. should. Um, but I, I think we need to stop associating addressable with performance. Yeah, um, I agree. That's one of the ways in which addressable can be leveraged, and we've just seen how well that can be done. Yeah. But there are other ways that are far more straightforward. You know, targeting an 18-plus audience with alcohol and gambling ads, you know, that's addressable. Um, and it's also broad reach. So there are loads of things that you can do, and you don't have to do all of them at once, and you don't have to be just looking at the pointy end of the funnel when it comes to addressable TV. It can also be used for very practical things. I think there's an additional point there where, yes, the tech needs to be set up, but I think pub publishers need to start thinking of their customers. Mm -hmm. So to the point with addressable TV, there is times where there's huge volumes. Mm -hmm. um, and there's not always um, a, a, there's not always supply to fill all those ads. And there is the, the the risk to sort of go, well, you know what, let's just go to Slate for out of a two minute break, if we can only fill a minute of it, let's fill the minute and let's go to a Slate for another minute, which is a really poor customer yeah. experience. But selfishly, as, a, as, as someone who wants to drive revenue, you're like, let's do that. But we, I think we need to get better at that. Um, we've set rules up internally. If we call ads and we can't fill the pod to an set amount of time, we actually drop the whole break and we send it back to what is classed as the dirty feed. And that has to be the right call. Now I sit here with my revenue hat on going, well I just lost 30% of my, of some video that I could have run, but I maintained a better customer experience. And when you're a paid for platform, that is a rule you have to start applying. I think the fear is the tech will allow us to insert as many ads as we want, yeah. but if we don't get the experience right with data and the ad, ex ad load, I think it's just going to be an awful thing to watch and people get really, really annoyed with it. I think, you're, I think uh, that's scary. 100% right, because, I mean, you heard back from Uber, like, the call out to the industry is, like, think about the user experience. It's more important to us brands as opposed to just getting the targeting and the messaging right. Yeah. So, so I think, I think we, we yeah, have your both hats on, age, um, us from a broadcaster, but think of the customer as well. And I'm sure that if the customer sees a better ad on a good product, um, they would get a better overall ad experience, which should drive a better brand outcome, versus really poor experience on a poor platform. Can't imagine it drives the same brand yeah. uplift. 
I think it, that just takes us back though to the, the concept around the importance of long-term thinking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So instead of just immediacy and targets and commission, that sort of thing, you know, quarterly mm -hmm. revenue, it's about long-term thinking. How do we build this out for the future of television? How do we really create a, a, a user experience that drives audience yeah. and that drives them in the long term? Because I think, as somebody said earlier, if you lose them, they've gone, that's it. Mm -hmm. yeah. and they're very unlikely to come yeah. back. I think that's a key point. When there's now non-ad funded platform, no ads in certain platforms or SVOD services, they can be gone forever and you may not get them back. So, yeah. you know, let's be really mindful of that. Call me optimist, but I, I feel like we're going like, oh, we need to do this. We, we've come a long way. Yeah. Like the platforms, the way they looked like 18 months ago, the experience was horrendous. It was horrendous. And we kept, you know, hearing CMOs and marketing directors, they fix it. You know, SSPs, DSPs, um, you know, um, ad servers, everyone has done such an yeah. amazing job. The, the, the experience now is extremely strong. And you know, when you have a really strong experience and now you're gonna have the measurement um, of coming from VOZ across BVOD and Linear to all of those clients that are in the room and used to tell us, oh yeah, but YouTube has this reach and YouTube, uh, it's now easy to buy BVOD, it's now easy to have strong measurement, it's now easy to see results from scalable, premium, professionally produced content at scale. So there is no debate anymore, and as I agree with you, there's still things to, to fix, but I think we need to be really positive about the work accomplished and kind of like be a bit proud about it. I think so, but I think there's so much more, and I've sat in meetings with clients, and when you talk about BVOD or talk about IP addressable, they still go, I still get them going, I saw the same ad four times mm -hmm. on a customer, and people laugh. So how many people have seen it? And you're like, we've got to get better at that. And I think that's where we've got to keep pushing technology, because you've got to get the experience right. You can talk to that a fake guy if you want. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> happens in New Zealand. Never happens in New Zealand. <laughs> I, no, I, def I definitely agree with that. We, we, we've gone a long way, but we have more yeah. to do. Especially if we think about the future of TV, which contains a lot more than yeah. just digital or just linear. Uh, for me, we really have three, three types of data that we need to consider. There's the, the kind of data-driven digital, so the BVOD yeah. kind of experience where broadcasters need to share the data, but in a secured way. Uh, they need to ask them, themselves the questions that is my asset protected, is my audience protected? Mm -hmm. They need to make sure that, so we, we're working with, with Fancast in, 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 and unique solutions with, with the broadcasters here, for example. So that, that's a good question to ask on a kind of digital uh, uh, aspect. Then you also have to think about, for the future, um, data-driven linear. So that, that's all the uh, Nielsen and all kind of panel-based kind of ratings. How, how do we make that available? Right? Um, um, how do we use that? How do we combine that with other ones? Um, and finally, you need to think about the addressable TV side, which are using different segments. Uh, some of them are similar, lifestyle, intent, uh, interest. Um, but some of them are unique, like CRM data from set of box providers, for example. This is very unique, like it's a contractual value, uh, which is you can then link to many different data. So I think if we talk about the future of TV, we should consider all aspects of data. Um, so yes, in the digital side, we've gone the wrong way, but I think there's a lot more to think yeah. about. Yeah. Cool, so I think it's nearly time to wrap up. So I just wanted to leave everyone and bring us back to the topic. I know that we went off skew a bit, but that's still <laughs> great. Uh, so today's topic was about preparing for an addressable TV stampede, stampede in Australia. Uh, I want one, I guess, everyone to uh, have a think about how fast will we see this accelerate realistically in Australia? Um, and what advice would you give uh, marketers in the room today who are thinking about including addressable TV in their media mix? Should we start with you, Juliet? Oh, God, here we go. Okay. <laughs> um, so, I think we have got a long way very, very quickly, and I think we should be very proud of that, and I completely agree, but we should always be asking for more. So it's always what's next, okay? Mm -hmm. We can't ever rest on our laurels, because at that point, the user experience on Netflix is way better, and then everybody's screwed. So I think that's it, just always strive for more and better every day. Um, and when it comes to how, what we, how we talk to marketers about the opportunity, make it really clear that it's actually really easy, the tech's in place, the publishers are investing really significantly in platforms, in technology partners to ensure that the user experience and the brand experience is great. 
in terms of how to actually create a stampede rather than a trot, um, there needs to be a lot less investment in YouTube. I mean, I, I really, you know, it's, it's, it's some, we, we often see 80% of video budgets going into YouTube. That's absolutely crackers. YouTube's great, and it, <laughs> you know, it does good things. And I'm not saying that people shouldn't be spending money on YouTube, but 80% of a budget is... <laughs> <laughs> 80% is too much, um, so stop. Talking about <laughs> <laughs> and then there'll be a Cool. Um, I cannot talk much about the, the, uh, the growth of the Australian market, but um, I can definitely say that TV is still the best marketing tool. Yeah. Um, we, we, so I would encourage the brands to kind of invest and, and go for it. You can find your way wherever you are in the funnel. You can uh, find a solution that will work for you. Yeah. Um, the the um, kind of all the things that we see as well in this market, all the collaborations that the alliance that was announced on Monday is great. That, that can only be been great things. Um, I think that can only move the industry forward. The, I find Australia very unique in that sense, where there is true collaboration. So that can only be good things for for the buyers. And and finally, I would say just both on the buy side and sell side. Um, Think about choosing the right partner to kind of future-proof your, your strategy because the kind of unifications of, of, the, um, of the both worlds, the and digital, will come, uh, and it's, it depends on how well you're prepared for that. Yeah, cool. Mm. Uh, when, we think of, when I think about are we prepared, you know, in the New Zealand market, we've seen uh, the BVOD growth at about 30% for the last three years. So when I read the 40... 43% in the Australian market. I'm now jealous of that. So that's my new target. <laughs> um, so yes, I think we are in terms of we've done a lot in our market. And the conversations I have with marketers are around, you know, the path to purchase isn't linear anymore. So you've got to find different ways throughout that user journey to engage with your audience and the opportunity for them to see an ad of your brand or your service. So I'd say think about addressable television as a relevant or contextual place that you can actually deliver your ad um, and allow that uh, that audience or that consumer to actually um, engage with that. And then use innovation. You know, God, it's fun. Everyone wants to get a brief that says, you know, do something yeah. innovative. So the scale of our market, that's where we win because actually we can try some different things. And um, I'll keep talking to the Australian market and show you guys some of that stuff as well. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> um, I think it's down to broadcasters and platforms to prove the effectiveness and actually the business outcomes that addressable TV provides. So I think we need to be better at talking about potentially reduced ad loads, greater cut through, um, and then how they drive business outcomes. I think the minute we do that, the money will come back in because it's easy for a marketer to put money on a plan when they know it's going to work. Yeah. Now, you can't always guarantee that. Creative plays a big part. But if you've got better engaged customers and you've got research to prove that it drives business outcomes, I think that's where the addressable TV stampede will come. So use linear, mass market, refine, use an addressable to target, and then drive the end outcome that way. I think that's how we'll get the stampede. It won't happen overnight. Okay. It simply won't. It will take time. I love that you're the sceptic on the panel today. But <laughs> and I love that you're the optimist yeah. as well. Jono? Um, no, I completely agree, actually, on the uh, attribution piece and you know, making sure that we prove the fact that it works. <laughs> Uh, but I would also say that I, I could you know, think of 20 clients that did not do anything on, on BVOD uh, two years ago and have you know, grow, grown their, their spend on that platform massively. So my message is to anyone in the room who has not uh, tipped their toes into uh, BVOD activity before, Call me. We're committed to uh, <laughs> doing some. I'm this serious, though. Speech. We're committed to uh, creating <laughs> some brand research with you guys. So uh, talk to us, and we'll prove you that it works and it actually drives actual output for for your business. <laughs> cool. Thanks. Well, thank you for the panel today. I think that's. Thank you. That's it. Yeah. Thanks, Justin. Yeah.